Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today. I'm Bruce Tatters, CEO at Red Cloud Securities. Today's webinar features Seabridge Gold, the premier gold and copper exploration development company that exists in capital markets today. All of its projects are domiciled in politically secure regions of Canada and the U.S. Seabridge ranks number one in gold reserves per share and number one in gold resources per share among all North American listed gold companies. It also, as Rudy will, will, will point out in the presentation, ranks extremely high on copper leverage as well. We're extremely privileged to have Rudy Franck, co-founder, chairman and CEO here to provide a general update and outlook for the company. In addition, we're equally excited to have Jim Anthony, Seabridge co-founder and well-known macroeconomic commentator with us today to provide an outlook on the gold market and an update to investors today on the current dramatic macroeconomic global events as they unfold in real time in front of our eyes. Hopefully Jim will share some of his wisdom on things and how things might unfold as we make our way through 2023. As always, we will begin with Jim's comments prior to discussing Seabridge with Rudy. After a formal presentation, we'll take questions live. Please send us your questions via chat and we'll get to as many as we can. You can type in your questions in the chat bo box, excuse me, at any time. To start, we'll handle disclosures and then we'll get right into it. For Seabridge, there may be some forward looking statements made on this call. I would direct listeners to the cautionary note on page two of the corporate presentation. For Red Cloud Securities, I would highlight that this webinar is for information purposes only and should not be considered a solicitation to purchase or sell securities or a recommendation to buy or sell them. As we always note with calls like this, we can't possibly take into the, per the, the particular situations of individual investors. They need to rely on their own investigations and seek their own professional advice before making any investment. Please see our most recent research located on our, we, on our website for Seabridge Gold for all specific disclosures. So now let's turn it over to Rudy and Jim, and Jim to begin. Okay, uh, Rudy, you wanna to move to our first slide here? Yep, I will do that. There's our forward looking statements. Okay, the world has changed in the last month it has changed probably more than the markets themselves recognize yet, but we're going to get into that. And the biggest change is that we're now facing a really big funding problem, a U.S. dollar funding problem shared by central banks and commercial banks. And the result is that inflation is no longer enemy number one. That's a newsflash. Next. So once upon a time, we had a much more stable universe. The US deficit was largely funded by foreign central banks, who recycled their trade surplus dollars into treasuries. That was the world before the great financial crisis. The dollar was universally accepted and reasonably stable versus oil, which is the main commodity on this planet. So it worked as the world's reserve asset. In 2010, foreign treasury holdings flatlined, but the U.S. debt continued to grow and it was filled, the gap was filled by quantitative easing. And that brought interest rates essentially down to zero, part of the plan for getting the U.S. economy moving again. And in order to make sure that there was an ongoing market for all the treasuries that were being issued, there were also reserve requirements uh, revised for commercial banks to force them to hold more treasuries and MBS during this period of zero interest rate. And by doing so, the U.S. actually proved it could no longer fund its deficits from capital markets, but that was the way it was. It was accepted, but the table was set for a major problem when rates actually increased. To the right, you can see on, on, these, on the graph that there's a an initial gap between the red and blue lines that comes in around 2010. The red line is the basic um, amount, you know, net interest of, uh, of foreign holdings of uh, treasuries, which as you can see, didn't change that much. And then a much bigger gap 
that ar arose after the pandemic hit us. So next slide, please. Funding problem number one, the US Treasury. So in 2018, the Fed tried to normalize monetary policy, which was roundly rejected by markets. That should have told us something. It did for some of us. The pandemic led to shutdowns and extraordinary $10 trillion in US fiscal and monetary stimulus. This is old news, but it's new again. It's important all over again. Debt rose to 31 trillion. You can see the graph at the bottom. Nice. Um, climb at the end of that graph. Uh, the Fed balance sheet more than doubled to $9 trillion. And the U.S. deficit now requires an estimated 72% of global growth if you wanted to fund it out of private markets. Wow. And in fact, that keeps going up. If you looked at last October's estimate by the Treasury, the estimate of what they now are going to raise in the second quarter is 60% higher. You know, thank you, Inflation Reduction Act and other such nonsense. The Fed, um, you know, deficits are rising as uh, tax revenues fall, capital gains are evaporating, and of course, the fiscal authority continues to spend aggressively on programs that are only slowing down growth, such as green energy. The Fed and other central banks are selling treasuries. Commercial banks are also sellers. Treasury interest expense is soaring, which is a classic doom loop. So, you know, the rates go up. You have to issue more securities to cover the extra expense. And the, the additional uh, issuance drives rates higher. Not a good situation. And the estimate now is for a 90, $900 billion interest expense for the US Treasury by year end. All of this has been enormously high pressure on the Treasury market. Jeffrey Gundelak now calls the Treasury market wildly illiquid. That's not a good thing. This is the world's most important financial market. Next slide, please. So if you look at the illiquidity and its effects on volatility, um, you know, the little black slide tells you that two-year yields go up and down by 25 basis points a day. The odds of that happening based on historical data is one in 50 million years or roughly back to the time of dinosaurs. That's amazing. Not a good sign. It makes it very difficult to trade treasuries, much less liquid. If you look at the move index, which is the upper right uh, chart, that's a measure of market, uh, treasury market volatility, very high. It's gone way past anything in the past. It's come down a bit recently, the last few days, but well, don't hold your breath on that one. Um, and then if you look below, foreign sales of 450 billion in treasuries in 2022 nearly destroyed the treasury market. It shouldn't be that illiquid, but it is. Next slide. Now, we also have some funding problems in the commercial banks, which are relatively better known and more followed. As you know, everybody knows, banks lend long and borrow short. And that wasn't a problem in the last 10 years, mostly until uh, 2020, because volatility was low, risk, risks and yields were low, so there was stability and relative ease in being in the banking business. The pandemic weakened loan demand, tightened lending standards, and of course, COVID stimulus flooded the banking system with all these savings that were at zero cost, so the banks didn't have to pay for them. And what did, what did they do with the money? Well, they bought debt securities and with the encouragement of the federal government and Fed. So the Fed continued QE and ZERP, 10 months too long by some estimates, maybe maybe 10 years too long, uh, creating inflation, which haha was transitory, and aided by Congress spending unnecessary extra trillions into the economy, we got rip-roaring inflation. No surprise to anyone who knows anything about economics. The Fed started the most aggressive tightening in history in 2022, well behind the curve as usual, and 2022 was therefore the worst year in the treasury market ever. 
and in part due to the fact that foreigners were fed up with the way uh, finances were being run in the U.S. So the foreign sales amounted to $450 billion, which the Treasury market had a hell of a time trying to absorb. Deposits left banks for higher returns elsewhere, which banks couldn't match because of the low yielding assets that they acquired during the zero interest period. Treasuries and agency debt fell in value, but the banks had to sell them for liquidity purposes anyway. Next slide, please. So here we are. What was the response? Well, there was something called the BTFP, which came out two weeks ago, which is the bank um, funding program on a term basis that allows uh, treasuries and MBS to be pledged uh, at, for free cash uh, without a haircut at the Fed. There's $2.7 trillion worth of this stuff. So you look at JP Morgan and Goldman Sachs saying, well, essentially, that's $2 trillion of QE because at least $2 trillion of that 2.7 is headed over to the Fed for zero cost money. And what happens after a year? Well, we don't know. Certainly looks like a market overhang from here. Now, there's also an implied guarantee of U.S. bank deposits, thanks to Silicon Valley Bank. Remember, there are $18 trillion worth of uh, savings and deposits at banks. But unfortunately, you have to go bust first to get the, uh, the backstop. We'll see if that changes. The BTFP does nothing for the thousands of banks who are losing more deposits than they have assets eligible for pledging at the Fed. Also, at the same time, we got a whole swath of dollar swaps. We don't even know how much yet. The aim for that was to slow down the sale of $7.3 trillion in treasuries owned by foreign banks and, and also to bail out foreign commercial banks. So bottom line, the new game plan is expand the Fed balance sheet. Does that sound familiar? It should. And in fact, in the last two weeks, $400 billion expansion in Fed balance sheet has occurred, which is two thirds of one year's worth of QT that has been reversed. Next slide, please. So with an expanding Fed balance sheet again, you would expect it would be good for gold and it will be. Tightening is over. Inflation is no longer the number one issue, although the Fed will still talk up a good game. The treasury market is. If the treasury market goes, there's nothing more to talk about. Dollar liquidity must increase to prevent liquidation of treasuries. The dollar is being sacrificed and inflation won't go back to 2%. If you look at the latest services PMI, for example, um, it had another little surge up uh, for March. Why? Because of wage pressure. Not good. Central banks are exchanging dollar assets for gold, so they know what the new play is. And in 2022, uh, official gold reserves went up a record 1,136 metric tons, while dollar foreign re <coughs> FX reserves fell a record 950 billion. What does this all mean? Gold has entered a new bull market, and happy days for Rudy and I, at least, are here again. Over to you, Rudy. Uh, thanks, Jim. Um, so uh, just by background, Jim and I formed Seabridge in October of 1999 with the expressed view of trying to create the industry's best leverage play to a rising gold price. We also, in our career, Jim and I have had minds that we've built expropriated by third world governments. So when we formed the company in 1999, one of our guiding principles was to try and minimize political risk by focusing only on North America. As you can see here, all of our assets are like located either in Western Canada or the United States. Our two most advanced assets include KSM in British Columbia, which is the world's largest undeveloped gold and copper project as measured by gold reserves or, or gold resources with a lot of copper, and also Courageous Lake in the Northwest Territories. We also have three early stage exploration projects in the portfolio, ISKIT, which we actually believe could be another KSM, three ACES in the Yukon and Snowstorm in Nevada. 
And I'll touch on each of those uh, in the presentation. The more important critical guiding principle that we followed from day one was to try and create the industry's best leverage play to a rising gold price. And we've done that through the simple concept of growing ounces in the ground faster than shares outstanding. The thought being that the more gold we can provide on a per share basis, the better our share price should do if the gold price goes higher. And as you can see on this chart, we've delivered on that in terms of growing ounces per share. In 1999, we basically had the market to ourselves being able to go out and buy uneconomic assets from the larger companies for pennies on the dollar. By the time we finished our first wave of acquisitions in 2002, we had about 27 million shares outstanding and about 15 million ounces of gold in the ground. So about a half an ounce of gold per common share. If you fast forward to the end of 2022, our gold count actually grew to 170 million ounces of gold in all resource categories, while our share count grew to just above 80 million shares. So at the end of 2022, each one of our shares was backed by just over two ounces of gold per share in the ground. And as you can see on, this, on these charts here, we actually provide more gold ownership per share than all the big gold companies and of any other company in our space. In terms of resources, over two ounces of gold per common share. In terms of pro proven and probable gold reserves, uh, about 0.66 ounces of gold per common share. And what this has translated into is what we were hoping for from the beginning, and that's to see our share price outperform the price of gold and other gold equities. As you can see here over the long haul, over the past 23 years, our share price is up over 5,000%, whereas the gold price is up by just about 500%. So we've actually outperformed the gold price on average by about 10 to one. It's always interesting to note here that the larger gold companies that tend to be the go-to stocks in the investing space have underperformed the gold price over the long haul. You would have been better off owning physical gold during that time period than shares of a Newmont, Barrick, at Nico Eagle, or any of the better known larger companies. I actually gave a presentation a few years back at Jim Grant's uh, Investor Day in New York City, explaining why in our view, the gold companies have actually not kept pace with the price of gold. And that's a whole other presentation. As Bruce mentioned along the way, we also found a lot of copper. At KSM, we now have over 50 billion pounds of copper in all resource categories. If you ignore our gold, ignore our silver, and ignore our molybdenum, we actually have more copper per share, either in terms of reserves or resources, than the leading copper companies. And why is that important? As Bowler says, Jim and I are in gold going forward. We also believe that the price of copper will go a lot higher as a result of a lack of new supply coming on the market in a market that demands more copper each and every year because of green energy initiatives. So if you like gold, like copper as well because they're both going higher. KSM is the asset that has driven most of our value over the past 15 plus years. It's an asset that we acquired in June of 2000 from Placer Dome. We bought this project for $200,000 after Placer Dome had spent over $25 million at the project. When we bought it, there was not a lot going on in the region. All of a sudden, this is becoming the go-to space for the major mining companies, either in the copper world or the gold world. Next door to us, we have a Newcrest that just recently purchased Predium. They also have a 70% interest in the Red Chris mine to the north of KSM. Numat is here. Tech is here. Freeport just showed up a few weeks ago in an earlier stage exploration play. The Golden Triangle of Canada, in my view, will become the most significant gold and copper camp in North America over the next couple of decades. At KSM, we've now spent about $800 million ourselves, defining not only the world's largest undeveloped gold and copper project, but a project that has successfully gone through the environmental assessment process with construction permits in hand. And to get to where we are today, we also have the support of the indigenous groups around the project, most notably the Taltan Nation and the Niska Nation, each of which we have a fully baked impact benefit agreement in place. When we bought KSM, infrastructure was not existent. That's changed as well. Fortunately, with other people's money, we now have a major highway just to the east of KSM, Highway 37. Along that highway, the government of Canada and British Columbia has invested over $700 million extending the power grid along that highway. 
All the power that comes into this grid is hydro source, so it's green power. We've now secured with contractual agreements with BC Hydro, 245 megawatts of power from this line, which is now being sold at the current tariff of about 5 cents per kilowatt hour. And then last but not least, just to the south of us, we have two ports to choose from, an older port that was rehabilitated to deal with Red Chris after Newcrest came in, and more recently, a brand new port that's recently been built there that's looking for an anchor tenant. Uh, my guess is that will become KSM. We talk about KSM as being a project. The fact is it's a district. At KSM, we now have five different deposits Current sulfurettes were known when we bought this project from Placer Dome. We expanded it to each of those through exploration. We found Mitchell in 2006. We found Iron Cap in 2010. And we purchased East Mitchell from our next door neighbor, Predium, in late 2020. Collectively, we have 11 billion tons of economic resources at KSM, either confined by open pit shapes or underground block cave shapes. And collectively, these, these 11 billion tons of economic resources provide over 150 million ounces of gold resources in all categories and over 54 billion pounds of copper. As we went through the environmental assessment process, however, right now we're only permitted for 2.3 billion tons of tailings. So even though we have 11 billion tons of economic resources to play with, right now we've limited all of our mine plans in terms of our reserve mine plans to the best 2.3 billion tons we can mine first to drive the best economics. Last year, we updated the pre-feasibility study to incorporate East Mitchell for the first time, the deposit we acquired from our next door neighbor, Predium. This updated study captured over 47 million ounces of gold and over 7 billion pounds of copper and proven and probable gold reserves. This updated study, we now are looking at a throughput capacity of 195,000 tons a day at 2.3 billion tons of resources or reserves, we can show a 33 year open pit only mine plan. We remove the block caves from this mine plan, 33 years open pit only, averaging over 1 million ounces of gold production a year and about 178 million pounds of copper a year. If you look at the projected economic performance, this is a project when you include the upfront capital, the sustaining capital, the closure costs, the reclamation costs, and the operating costs, net of copper and silver byproduct credits, you're looking at an all-in cost of production of about $600 an ounce for each ounce of gold produced. That's about half of what the industry is now reporting as their all-in sustaining cost. And as, as I pointed out, this mine plan ignored the higher grade copper deposits that had been included in previous mine plans. To show the optionality of KSM to higher grade to higher copper prices, we also showed an alternate mine plan, which added another 39 years of mine life by capturing resources at Iron Cap and Kerr into a underground block cave scenario, adding 39 years of mine life with tremendous economics as well. One of the unique things about KSM is that the flexibility you have in terms of the the, the uh, how you can how you can build and operate this mine for a copper company that wants to go after copper production you have iron cap and deep Kerr as shown in these slides for a gold company that wants to focus on gold mostly you have the pfs study but there's also the integration where you actually can start to mix and match and actually make the project even more economically attractive by moving some of the blockades forward Sorry, here's the slide. I was one slide behind. Here's the slide on the economic assessment uh, with the extra 39 years of mine life, capturing uh, another 16 billion pounds of copper and 23 million ounces of gold. Uh, the size of this project is just mind blowing. To think here that we can show 72 years of mine life here with the PFS mine plan and the PEA mine plan and only capture about 40% of the project's uh, economic resources. One of the reasons why the First Nations are so supportive of this project, they see a project here that will not only be around for 10, 20, or 30 years, they see a project that will probably last for well over 100 years, making it multi-multi-generational and providing a lot of jobs and, uh, and financial benefits to their nations over time. As I mentioned, we did get this project approved with the environmental assessment approvals in 2020, 2014. 
The environmental certificates we have are set to expire in Jul July of 2026. Fortunately, there is a mechanism in British Columbia known as substantially started that if we can achieve this objective, our permits are then good for the life of the project. So a little over a year ago, we went out and secured US $225 million in funding from Sprout Royalties and Ontario Teachers Pension Plan, where we sold them a secured note and that note will automatically convert into a royalty on silver production at commercial production. The funds from this uh, secured note sale are being used to build camps, to build roads, to build fish compensation, uh, to bring, uh, build a power uh, switching station that's required to tie into the grid and also for building bridges. Here you can see in this one picture here, last year we completed a uh, construction of a 100-man uh, camp uh, that's now fully operational. Uh, we also started working with BC Hydro. We signed a contract with them for $84 million. And with that funding, they are now building our switching station that we plan to tie into with the grid over the next few years. Building roads, uh, before this, there were no roads into the site area. Last year, we finished 17 kilometers of the first road coming up from Highway 37, uh, past our camp and into the Treaty Creek area. Uh, that road will continue this year towards the mill site as well as towards the, the saddle area. And then the road on the right is coming down from the old SK Creek mine. That'll provide road access uh, from the highway down to where the deposits are located. A big part of our development plan is to offset fish, comp fish areas that will be destroyed, mainly in the Tallings area. We have approvals from the government to, to, to basically offset that fish habitat with new fish habitat that we're building. Here's our first fish habitat site right off of Highway 37 that will be completed this year. And then last but not least, we have two major river crossings. Last year, we finished the first permanent bridge over the Bell Irving River. This now provides uh, road access from Highway 37 up past our camp and into where we're now building the road on Treaty Creek. We will continue substantially started activities throughout 2023 and then expect to be in a position sometime next year to apply to the government for that designation. And again, the reason we're doing this is to make sure that our permits do not expire. Our second large asset is Courageous Lake located in the Northwest Territories an asset we acquired from New Mountain Total in 2002. Uh, it's located uh, just south of the two big diamond mines, Diavec and Ikati, and just off the winter road that services those two large diamond mines. When we bought this project, there was about 5 million ounces of known resources. We conducted exploration here before we did any work at KSM, growing the resources to just over 10 million ounces. In 2012, we completed a pre-feasibility study showing a project that could be large, but not very economic at a time when the Canadian dollar was at par with the US dollar. However, if you just change the, the exchange rate and the metal price, you see a project that was not very economic a few years ago, looking very different today. We've now decided to take the step. We will be updating the pre-feasibility study at Courageous Lake this year. Uh, we'll actually be looking at a smaller startup project here, which will actually be more beneficial in terms of uh, less capital needed to build the mine and much more robust from an, from an economic and financial perspective. That updated study should be completed by the end of this year. We made our name through the drill bit and from 1999 to 2002, we took advantage of a down market, went out and bought Courageous Lake, KSM and a few other projects along the way. In 2015, that window opened up again. Gold had traded a few years before that at 1900 and crashed down to about $1,000 an ounce in 2015. And in that market environment, valuations got decimated again. And the big companies were willing to do what they would always do in the past, and that's go out and sell non-core assets at market bottoms. We came into the market and bought three projects. Uh, the first was Iskit, which is a project that's located about 20 or 30 kilometers from KSM. We bought Iskit because we believe there's a lot of similarities to what we saw at KSM when we acquired that, we see the same thing at ISCIT. We are now focusing our exploration activities at ISCIT, focusing on copper gold porphyry deposits. Last year, we tagged a large breccia zone underneath the existing Bronson Slope deposit, where essentially right from the surface, we intersected 174 meters of 0.86 gold and 0.34% copper. We have an $8 million program planned this year for ISCIT that will continue to focus on expanding the Bronson Slope deposit as well as testing a number of other gold copper porphyry targets that we have in our sites. 
underneath the Breccia zone, the only explanation that we can come up with is that there has to be a deep-seated uh, intrusive there, and we'll be looking for that in this year's drilling. Second acquisition we did when the market bottomed in 2015 was a project called Snowstorm in Nevada that we acquired from John Paulson, a large land package that sits just north of Twin Creeks and, uh, and Turquoise Ridge, two of the larger mines in the Nevada joint venture between Newmont and Barrick. Our focus has been to try and find Twin Creeks and Turquoise Ridge style mineralization. In previous drill campaigns, we confirmed that the structures that exist down at Tur Turquoise Ridge and Twin Creeks do indeed run into our claim block. And then last program, we actually confirmed that there's actually uh, gold in those structures. This year, we hope to vector into some of the higher grades. We have three holes planned here for this year, spending about $3 million to hopefully vector into, into higher grade mineralization. Obviously, the best place to find a new deposit is right next door to a mine that will need new reserves at some point in the not too distant future. Our third acquisition is Three Aces in the Yukon, a project we acquired in uh, the height of COVID from Golden Predator, a project that at one time generated a market cap to Golden Predator in excess of $200 million. Because of the impact of COVID on equities, we were able to come in and buy this project for about $3 million in 2020 by issuing a Golden Predator 300,000 shares. It's a large land package, a lot of gold showings up and down, if you actually look at some of the historical drilling that's been done here, phenomenal intersections of high-grade gold very close to the surface. We have a $7 million program planned for Three Aces this year. We spent the last two years working with the government and the First Nations to achieve and get our, 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 our exploration permit here. We now have that in hand, and we'll be starting drilling here sometime in June. So when I look at Seabridge, why I have 95% of my net worth in Seabridge common shares? Well, like Jim, I believe that the gold price is poised to go a lot higher, as will copper. We have a 23-year track record of outperforming gold in a rising gold environment. If that's going to happen again, our shares should do what they've done in the past, and that's provide tremendous optionality and leverage to higher gold prices. Second reason is the world now is running out of new projects to build, both in terms of copper and gold. There's very few large opportunities left for the majors, as, as evidenced by some of the jurisdictions that some of the bigger companies are now willing to go into, which you scratch your head and say, wow, that's a lot of political risk. KSM is located in one of the safest mining jurisdictions in the world. It's a project that has now achieved um, uh, its permits in hand. It's a project that's now starting early site construction. The gold companies need new reserves, they need new projects, the copper companies need new projects. And as I mentioned earlier, I think the gold and triangle is going to be an area of focus for many of the largest companies out there. We made our name through drilling. We were very successful early on at KSM and Courageous Lake. We now have a few new exploration uh, projects in the portfolio, any one of which we believe can be a company maker. And we are getting to work on each of them in a big way this year. <laughs> There's no question that the addition of East Mitchell that we acquired from Predium in late 2020 has been a game changer for KSM. Not only does it significantly improve KSM's economics from previous studies, but it makes the project more attractive for those companies that don't have blockading capabilities. All of our previous mining plans before East Mitchell involved blockade mining. There's very few companies out there that know how to blockade. By removing that from the, from the equation, we are now sitting down with the most interest we've ever had at KSM in a joint venture. We've made it known many years ago that KSM is beyond our capabilities. We need a major mining company to come in and, and, and co-work this asset with us. Our, our preferred structure is a joint venture where, the, where our, our interest would be to keep a meaningful stake in the project while minimizing our capital contribution. I think we now have our best foot forward to get a deal done. I know we've been talking about a deal for a number of years, although we have received a number of proposals over the years, not quite the right one yet. With the additions we've made now with East Mitchell and also our willingness to take on substantially stored activities on our own, we think we've now set the stage to get a deal done that we can say yes to. Finally, one other distinguishing characteristic of, KS, of, of Seabridge is the, is the strong insider ownership that we have. Insiders own over 30% of the stock. 
And then if you look at the next larger group of shareholders, mostly institutional, that tend to be uh, goal-focused, it takes about 10 phone calls for us to get more than 50% of our stock on the line. That's pretty unique in the, in the, in the gold mining space. And then finally, before we turn it over to questions, Bruce, we are dual listed all over a Canadian company. Most of our volume actually trades with the New York Stock Exchange. So Bruce, with that, happy to answer questions. Thanks, Rudy. I, first thing I would mention is there's some questions uh, in the chat bar now, but this is the time. There's lots of people on the line. We're going to ask both Jim and Rudy. We're going to probably go back and forth with questions to each of them. Please, uh, now is the time to put up any questions either directly related to Seabridge or any of its projects uh, or capital structure or what have you, or any macro questions you have or, or outlook questions uh, for Jim. Please be sure to put them on the line. I'm going to start with Jim and I'm going to start with one of my own because I found this extremely interesting the other day, uh, Jim, and I wanted to put it to you. And that is there was some really good commentary in the last few days that typical bank runs uh, that we find ourselves into at various points uh, in history have used to used to happen from concern over credit quality of loan books and portfolios. Right. And the commentary over the last few days is that this is one of the very first bank runs we've seen because depositors have smartened up. And with the attractiveness of treasury bills yields mm -hmm. versus bank deposits, as you right. clearly pointed out, the banks having so much of their duration and, and assets tied into such low yielding things aren't yep. able to, 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 to push up their, their deposit rates for customers really well. So we're actually starting to see bank runs because liquidity is drying up and deposits and moving to higher yielding, more liquid, more secure assets like treasury bills. So that has got to be a terrible for banks. Let's just start there. And B, one would think that that, you know, when you look at different liquidity measures, the different M measures, one would think that uh, available cash drawing out of, out of these institutions and into places that are not quite as liquid and more sort of investment focused is going to really drain the system of liquidity. And we all, you know, from Ray right. Dalio, we all learn that credit is credit is credit and liquidity is how economies run. So just curious okay. as to your thoughts about what we see in the, right, right now. Well, you've nailed it. Um, and that's why, you know, the theme of my presentation was we have a big funding problem. The banks, um, and in fact, credit from banks has been the key to expanding the money supply and expanding the economy. We are a credit driven economy. The deposits, the depositors are leaving for very good reasons. And, you know, some of that can be replaced through the BTFP by uh, getting, um, rounding up the bank's mortgage backed securities and and treasuries and pledging them at the at the fed and there's 2.7 trillion they can do of that good stuff but there are 18 trillion dollars worth of deposits there's just not enough to cover that and as the banks shrink and that seems to be what's going to happen there're about 4000 banks in the united states give or take um they will be going out of the loan business. They're virtually out of the loan business now anyway, because of the difficulties in, in establishing what is good credit in an economy that's just coming out of the pandemic. So you look at things like commercial real estate, you know, the banks have $2.3 trillion of commercial real estate uh, mortgages, and they need to roll those over, 250 billion of them this year, are they going to get rolled over? Can banks do it? Or do they need their money back? And it seems to me they are going to be need their money back, many of them. So we're looking at a very significant credit contraction. And actually, Powell hinted at that in his last Q&A after the last FOMC. What are they going to do about it? That's a dollar shortage, in effect, a credit shortage that has to be filled. There's no way around it. And so when people worry about, you know, deflation and the fact that, um, you know, the, the contraction will lead to deflation, they are leaving out of the equation the obvious 
requirement from uh, the Fed that they do something about this and do it fast. Now, they've taken a first step with the BTFB, but they need to do a lot more. And just one follow up to that before I give uh, move on to a question to Rudy. The other thing that it really seems to be doing, uh, there's been a lot of commentary about the difference between the big money center banks yep. and the regional banks. And yep. the regional banks provide a very different function to real time yes. local businesses, local consumers in regions around the U.S. that, you know, through credit providing. That doesn't happen by the big money center banks who deal with Fortune 500 companies. And there seems to be a real dichotomy about, um, you know, there's systemically important institutions that are above a threshold, but we might wipe out a whole generation of these regional banks that provide a function that the big guys aren't doing. Right. And th that's uh, two thirds of all jobs created are in smaller firms. They get their money from smaller banks. If you're funding, um, you know, a car dealership and you know doing a, a floor plan, you're not getting that from J.P. Morgan. You're getting that from your local bank. If you have a, a Class B office building uh, in um, Poughkeepsie, you're not dealing with J.P. Morgan. You're dealing with a local bank. So the 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 effect of the contraction is going to aim right at the heart of job creating in the US. And that's that's we're going to see that by the end of this year in terms of a significant uptick in unemployment. Okay, so let's move over to Rudy. Um, one of the questions it's uh, targeted towards copper. The copper grades at KSM seem low to existing mines. Are there different processing methods necessary to harvest them for KSM? No, fortunately, we have tremendous uh favorably metallurgy there. Uh, we basically have one uh, one uh, mill design here where you basically take your material through a uh, crusher's first then a flotation circuit, you make a copper concentrate. You then take the uh, what falls off the copper concentrate, you put that through a CIL circuit to make to get gold and silver. And when moly grades are high enough, you make a moly concentrate. You, you, you know, when you look at KSM, you can't just look at a specific uh, grade of copper or specific gold, a grade of gold, you have to look in the combination. What is the combined metal value, recoverable metal value per ton of ore? When we do all of our analysis, we actually we run it through an NSR. What is a net smelter return payment back to the company based on all the four metals we have and the recoveries in place? And then obviously the smelting and the refining and treatment charges. Uh, so that's important to look at. Um, you know, you look at projects around the world, uh, these these grades that we're forecasting here in our reserve grade are, are, are actually quite high compared to other operating gold copper projects around the world. And if you look at our PEA mine plan, the 39 years with the block caves, those copper grades are much higher, but at the sacrifice of lower gold grades. I'm going to give you a follow up, uh, Rudy, because we gave Jim two. So uh, next one is what is the main hurdle to developing the project? <laughs> Six and a half billion dollars. <laughs> I was going to say that, but I'm, it's your webinar, not mine. So uh... I, mean, I mean, let's 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 face it. That's a big number. However, when you look at what big companies make now in terms of annual cash flow and their need for new projects, these are exactly the kind of projects that big companies are starting to look at. Po uh, case in point, Barrick looking to do a similar size project in Pakistan. That's probably going to cost the same amount of money, but obviously with a lot more political risk. Now, the fact is to build a project this this scale, it's six, seven, eight billion dollar projects. Uh, we're fortunate that, you know, capital is one thing, operating costs are another, because we have the ability to use hydropower for all of our electrical needs there, which essentially we will. We're looking at low operating costs here. Uh, so you look at the upfront capital of 6.5 billion. By the way, some of it we're spending now and substantially started, so that number will come down. But you look at that amount of capital at today's metal prices, not using higher gold or copper prices than today's, but at today's metal prices, you get your money back in three years on a project that goes on for another 69 years. So uh, capital efficiency is important. Yes, it's a big capital number. And for the first time in years, the big companies are now looking for new opportunities that they can build. And KSM is one of the few out there that 
that checks a lot of boxes. Thanks, Rudy. All right, back to you, Jim. So very exciting when somebody who I respect says we're entering a new bull market because that doesn't come out of your mouth often. Mm -hmm. And I know it's been a while since we started a new bull market in gold. So the question is, what do we think short, medium, and longer term that new bull market looks like? Are we going to, is it going to be quiet for the balance of the year? Will some of these macro things uh, focus themselves out? What might be some triggering events to to breaking this gold market out to new highs is what I would ask you. Well, since the market is focused on the banking system more than on the treasury market, we could look there first. Um, I would have thought that Deutsche Bank would have gone before uh, Credit Suisse. They didn't. And I'm sure they'll get a lot of help from the uh, German government uh, when it's needed, but it will be needed. Um, the, the, um, the swap lines will also help. But, you know, what we have in the European banking system, first of all, is um, a whole series of banks that never got fixed in 2008. They decided just to go to sleep with a whole lot of non-performing loans. It's extraordinary non-performing loans in the Italian banking system are running at 18% of the asset base. <laughs> you, you shouldn't be doing that. So there's lots to go wrong here on the banking side. And there's the slow drip, drip, drip of those depositors leaving the U.S. banking system. How will the Fed deal with that? That's a pressure that has to be dealt with this year, not sometime in the future. And the BTFB has a one year life that has to be addressed. So there are lots of outstanding questions that are going to make people nervous and that will turn this uh, investing um, psychology more to a risk averse uh, type of thinking, which is needed in part for gold to do better. So those are, those are just some of the issues, but the one that, I think is most disturbing and maybe most imminent is a concern about the treasury ability to finance itself. It wasn't able to do so in 2018. It wasn't able to do so in 2014. QE was necessary. Why is it not necessary now? Who's going to come to the rescue of growing deficits in the U S economy of an interest expense that is, um, running off the charts from 600 billion to 900 billion in, in a space of a year and a half who's going to pay for that it has to be funded and i think the it, it can only be funded ultimately by uh, the fed so we're going to see quantitative easing again it's probably going to look a lot like it did after the second world war so it'll be yield curve control not unsimilar from or dissimilar from what's happening in japan although it's a very different world there. And that is going to drive the dollar down and drive gold up. And I would say that's the perhaps the key threat to the dollar right now is the fact that the, the Treasury is not able to fund itself without the Fed. Thanks, Jim. Okay. Um, Rudy, question, CapEx cash needs in 2023 and 2024. Well, How are we first, looking? We t we're looking strong. We entered this year with the strongest balance sheet we ever had, over one hundred and thirty million dollars uh, in uh, in cash and uh, and, and short term deposits. Uh, obviously, we're going to spend a lot more this year on on substantially started, not as but, you know similar to last year, as well as uh, exploration plays. Uh, we've never started a January with enough cash on the balance sheet to get through to the end of the year. Fortunately, we have a strong shareholder base that continues to fund us as needed. Uh, we have an ATM in place that allows us to tap the equity markets when the markets are strong. Uh, we have some options coming due. We have access to flow through financings anytime we want. Last flow through financing we did, I think, at a 42% premium. So our shareholders are comfortable knowing that we will get the job done in terms of what we need to raise, but at the same time, minimizing equity, uh, equity dilution. Uh, Dilution is the enemy in the exploration business and the mining business. It always amazes me how quickly share counts can go from 10 million shares 
to hundreds of millions of shares to billions of shares outstanding without offsetting that. We are very careful with our capital structure. We go year to year and we fund as necessary by trying to minimize equity dilution. Uh, this year will be no different than years past. Thanks, Rudy. Jim, back to you. Um, I mean, I could do two at a time, but I'm, we'll go back and forth uh, for the time because there's some for each of you. Um, you're suggesting that we can't ignore inflation, uh, right. particularly with what's going on in the wage front. But is it possible that just the wages were on the, the, the lagged uh, catch up with the headline inflation numbers of well over a year ago? And the question, the follow up question would be, don't don't aren't we with with all of the pressures that we see happening in both Treasury and banking markets tightening credit? Don't won't that overwhelming deflationary scenario take control of inflation here? If it does, uh, you may have to find another planet to go live on. I'm aware it only <laughs> happens once. <laughs> That's right. Oh, um, like an asteroid. Yeah, like an uh, that's yes that that is a um, a mass um, what is the term um, victim Extinct. event? Yes, mass yeah. extinction event. Yeah, it, it a mass extinction event. It's um, the Fed can't allow that. You know, a hundred uh, well thirty one trillion in debt tells you that you can't do that. Um, where is that debt? Well, it's in pension funds, and it's in insurance companies. You can't let it go you have to bring you know the the, the credit um you have to bring the cost of credit down and you have to make it more available or the system collapses and you know the, the um the reality is that that's the last thing the fed will allow so we're going to have to sacrifice um getting control of inflation it's already happening you know the what the fed has done is not enough they didn't raise rates above the inflation rate, which is what Volcker did. If you yes. don't do that, you're not actually serious about defeating inflation. Agreed. We, you yeah. and I had many conversations uh, well over a year ago, but they would never be able to do that. No, the way Volcker no. Did. they actually you do got not have the circumstances today to allow for that. Not, you know, it, you know, you look at the difference between now and 2008. In 2008. There was no inflation. They could flood the world with money, and there were really no serious consequences. They got the banking system straightened out in a few months, and and not that they loaned a lot of the money they got, but but they certainly had some nice bonuses. But that's not now. Now is there is an inflation problem, and the Fed is going to have to turn its back on it anyway. Now they'll try to do so in a way that tries to restore some of the or. or keep some of the credibility uh, of an inflation fighter. So they may look at dropping QT first. I mean, their balance sheet is already growing again at the rate of 200 billion a, a week. So basically it's gone anyway. Um, maybe they can do quantitative easing and have a, an interest rate of five or 6% on the Fed funds rate. Maybe they can find a way of combining things, but there will not be anything that brings the treasury market to a halt and it nearly got there last year it was a terrible terrible market and you talk to people who tried to trade off the run issues in the treasury market you know a trade that would typically take 10 seconds was taking 10 minutes that's not good and so as you know jeffrey gundlach said who's the bond king now um, the illiquidity in the treasury market is scary it's unbelievable. It's never happened before. That's not going to continue. And if you look at you know, a credit contraction and not dealing with it, uh, that's what you're going to have. You're going to have an, a collapse of the economic system and the financial system as we know. So one would think that they're not smart enough to completely let that happen. No, they're, 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 not they're trying to fight against that. So, yeah, that's right. All right, Rudy, back to you. Listen, this is an age-old question that I've been I've known you forever and for a long time people have been asking this question, but I think I think it's a very important question because I think it will be the single largest catalyzing event to the value of Seabridge and that is a J, from off the line here, a JV partner is critical to KSM. What kind of interest are you seeing? 
from a potential partner and with gold near 2000 and copper near $4, why aren't we seeing Seabridge rising with those commodities? I guess that's a two part question. Yeah. Um, well, the, the which first, we were talking about in advance, but why don't you go ahead? Yeah, well, the first part of that, I mean, uh, clearly, if you look at gold equities right now relative to the gold price, gold stocks are as cheap as they've been in a long time. Here with gold pushing to 2000, it's hard to believe that Seabridge is trading, you know, at $17 Canadian. Uh, you know, it's not just Seabridge, though. It's across the board. It's I mean, look at, New, look at Newmont. Newmont has gone from 84 last year when gold were at these similar levels down to a recent low in the low 40s. There's just not a lot of interest right now in gold equities. As the gold price breaks out from here, though, I think you're going to start to see the Western investor show up who tends to buy uh, gold equities. In terms of KSM, there's no question in my mind that a joint venture announcement will create a lot of value very quickly. And as I've said for years, we're looking for a joint venture partner. It hasn't happened yet. We've gotten close a few times. We've turned down a number of proposals that didn't meet our objectives. All, all along the way, though, we saw ways that we could actually improve our position in negotiations by continuing to de-risk the asset. The last two pieces of the puzzle are now in place. Bringing East Mitchell into the mine plan has now made a project that's far more attractive than it's ever been in the past, not just in terms of economics, clearly it's a lot better now, but also in terms of uh, implementation of a mine plan here. With block cave and mining and all of our previous mine plans, you had to start developing the block caves in the first 10 years of mine life. There's very few companies out there of the largest mining companies that know how to block cave, in fact, only two. So having a mine plan out there that most companies couldn't execute on was a challenge. We've removed that now. For those that want a block cave, it's still there. But for those that can't, you don't need to worry about it. And the second part of the issue in terms that we were facing in terms of uh, joint venture negotiations were our permits. Even though we got our permits in 2014, they were originally set to expire in 2024, a 10 year period. That was always a hindrance for big companies looking at this as well, because okay, you can get into this project, engage with it, and then in a sh few short years, if I haven't started construction here, uh, the permits will expire. We were fortunate that as a result of COVID with the support of our indigenous partners, we were able to get an extension on our permits to 2026. When we got that extension, we said, okay, we now have the runway ourselves to go out and remove that risk from any joint venture discussion by doing substantially started. So we went out last year in a very creative financing without any equity dilution and raised $225 million with Sprout and teachers to actually do that work. The work we're doing now at KSM last year and this year will allow us to be in a position to apply for those that substantially started designation next year, which will then result in a further de-risking of the asset. So we think at this point in time, we've always talked about terms, Trump timing, but now we're at a point where we've gotten all the work done that we can see to de-risk the asset. So now's the time to get a deal done. We have never seen more interest than we're seeing right now. A lot of that has to do with the uh, metal markets where they are, but also the ability for the big companies to transact again. For many years, they were more focused on cleaning up their balance sheets, selling non-core assets, paying down debt, and returning capital to shareholders through dividends, and through share buybacks. The problem with that is they didn't invest in the future. As a result, the gold industry now has less reserves today than ever from a timing perspective. The big gold companies need new projects. The big copper companies need new projects. Here we're sitting with a project that has been significantly de risk and is never more attractive than it is today. So I, I am confident uh, that we will get our deal done within the next 12 months and will be off and running in terms of value. Thanks, Rudy. So listen, I could keep asking questions and there's more on the line here. What I think we're going to do is, is give Rudy the transcript of questions uh, so he can come back to those individuals after. But we're, we're on to three o'clock now, a full hour into this. Time really flies when we're having fun. Um, I want to thank you, Rudy, and I want to thank you, Jim, uh, for being on the call today. And uh, I, had a, I had a tremendous amount of fun. I always enjoy this. So thank you so much. Yeah. You're a great moderator, Bruce. You're our favorite. Yeah, <laughs> Bruce. Bruce, thanks again. You and I have known each other for well over thirty years, and you've always been there in my corner. So I really appreciate that, and uh, look forward to continuing working with you. 
It's a good corner to be in. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, guys. And thanks, Take everyone, care. for Take taking care. the time to join us today. We appreciate it. Thank you. Take care.